This discussion is called Finding the Fingerprints of God and the Origin of the Universe. Now, the creation of the universe and life itself is a still a mystery. It's wonderful, but it's a mystery. To explain it, we have two choices as to how it came to be. In other words, where did it come from? One is at random chance with natural selection, and the other is a spiritual creator, not of this physical world, and that's important, physical. So he's not of the physical world. He's from the spiritual world, but who is able to create the entirety of our physical universe and life itself. We know that we exist. We can, we can look at each other. We're here we are. So the question becomes whether modern science can explain the main creation events and how, this, how we came to be or not. If not, then by logical deduction, a creator becomes the more reasonable choice. Now we talk about the deductive principle. We're talking about how we decide what's the best choice. We look at all the choices and eliminate the least likely. And the remaining choice is therefore the most reasonable. For instance, here's a good example. This is the way your bedroom looked like when you went to school. It was a total mess. When you got home, it looked like this. So what is the best explanation for this? Number one, a strong wind blew through the window and put everything away. Second choice, an older brother or sister came home from college and they cleaned your room. Or the third choice is your mom cleaned your room and put everything back in its right spot. The logical by logical deduction, we can say answer three is correct. Now when we look at the seven creation events that have occurred, and they all have occurred because we're here, and we have to decide whether it's more reasonable to believe that an intelligent creator was responsible or that it was just random chance or just good luck. Those are our choices. In this discussion, we're going to look at seven key creation events. These all happened. And then we're going to have to decide what's the most likely explanation and how do we do that? Well, we look at everything science knows, and we know the mind of God here is on this side. And God lives in a transphysical world, so we can't just ask him. Here you can ask science. And so what we want to look at are the creative events. And those are the points where a known reality, so we can see the frog, we can see us, we can see trees. We know they came into existence. And that's where we want to look at, at the very beginning, when they came into existence the very first time. Now here are the seven creative events we're going to talk about. How does the Earth start with the Big Bang? Where do the elements come from? We're going to talk about supernova and stardust. Where does our Earth come from? We talk about the Nifty Nebula and how our Earth and Sun were formed. Then all these have to do with, the, with life itself. Now if you have any living cell, whether it's a plant, animal, or us, Every cell in our body, and there's millions of them, have to have this very complex structure called DNA. And all that is is the instructional manual for making everything that a cell needs. Now within plants, here's the jolly green chloroplast. Chloro means chlorophyll. And green plants were created with an ability to make oxygen out of carbon dioxide and sunlight. Amazing. The mitochondria refers to the structure, the little organelle in every cell in our body, every single one. And it, it provides the energy. It's like the fuel. It manufactures that fuel that all the parts of the body can use to do whatever they have to do. And finally, when you add up all these parts from one to the other, and you put them all together, they would just sit there unless there's a spark of life. So who turns on the spark of life? That's a major question, and we know what the answer is. Well, the first question you might have is would, when we started out, what did we start out from? And the answer, there was nothing there. What the heck is nothing? Well, it's just blankness. There's nothing is nothing. Before our universe was created, there's nothing. There's no light, no space, no sound, no substance, no, no time. So the question is, what can come out of nothing? Well, the answer is nothing. Nothing can come out of nothing. What can nothing do? Well, the answer is nothing. It can't do anything. So preceding our world, our universe, there was nothing there that was physical. There was God in his transphysical world, but there was nothing in our physical world. Hey, wait a minute. Did our universe just start out of nothing? I didn't think anything could come from nothing. If so, when did that happen? Well, the answers are, yes, it did happen. Our universe came out of nothing. It was created 13.8 billion years ago. Our physical universe is not of infinite age. It hasn't been there forever. It has 
It started with the Big Bang. Now, what do we think about that? Well, we know our world is real. We know it's impossible for nothing to create anything on its own. Nothing cannot create nothing. Therefore, it is the most reasonable explanation that a transphysical, not a physical being like ourselves, but a creator exists with a very special plan and a very creative design. So from nothing, no light, no sound, no time, no matter, no space, and no evidence of any preceding universe. So it's not like the science fiction shows where they think there's a matrix out there and people can move from one universe to another. We have no evidence that there was anything preceding our world and we'll, our universe, and we'll talk about that on the later slide. What we want to carry away, our universe is not infinite. It has a birthday, and it came out of nothing, and the first event is called the Big Bang. So I have another question. Was the Big Bang really loud? It sounds like it, Big Bang. And the next question, weren't we told that the universe, our world, has existed forever? Well, the answer is no, the Big Bang was silent. What happened was there, there was a tremendous explosion of just energy, and most of that energy was light. Like the Bible says, let there be light, and that's exactly what happened. This is called electromagnetic energy, and we'll talk about that in a minute. It's a big word, but it's really not very complex at all, and you're going to know all about it when I show you that slide. But what this did, all this energy left remnants behind, which they've discovered in the last few years. And because they can see this remnant that is called cosmic, like in the cosmic space, microwave, just like your microwave at, at your house, background, and it's still there floating around in our universe, all parts of our universe have this. And there's no other evidence of any other microwave from any other universe. So we are a single universe definite age, 13.8 billion years, and there appears to be no other evidence of any other, we're not a bubble off some other remote universe. And when it starts, the very first thing, that first little explosion is called singularity. It's the single point of origin. So we know the world has not existed forever. It's 13.8 billion years old. Now in the last slide we mentioned electromagnetic energy. It sounds like a big word and you say I've never heard of that. But in fact you have because if we break down that what are the choices? This starts out as just a wave. So all of these are just a wave. They don't have any weight to them at all. So it weighs nothing but it's just a wave of energy. Now do you understand do you have a cell phone and it contacts the satellites by a radio wave? Okay so those are electromagnetic energy forms a radio ray when you look outside, the sun's shining, we're seeing light. That's a light ray. You have your lunch, you stick it in a microwave. Remember our cosmic microwave background? It's the same thing that comes out of your machine when you cook your lunch. If you injure your hand and you go to the doctor, you get an x-ray. And above that, there are gamma rays, which are used to treat various kinds of conditions. So all of these are make up a whole spectrum we call electromagnetic energy. And all of this is the same stuff that came when the Earth was created with, this, with the Big Bang. Bang. It's all of these types of energy all at once. Now here's another mystery of creation. Remember, we talked about electromagnetic radiation in the Big Bang. It came shooting out. But there was no substance to it. There was no stuff. But lo and behold, here's another mystery alert. These high energy waves, just light waves, they crash together. So they don't weigh anything. But when they crash together, they make a lot of energy, and they're able to create these little particles. Particles have names, funny names, like neutrons, protons, electrons. And they all, because of those nuclear forces we talked about, come together very quickly. So when you have just one, one, and one, you end up with the three of them coming together, making a little atom. When there's just two of them, it makes hydrogen, but they don't like to live alone. And pretty soon they add some other parts to make helium. We're going to talk about that in a minute. But what holds these, these, these are nuclear forces that hold these particles. You can see they're attractive. Here's a positive force and a negative, just like a battery. And they are a magnet. You like you know about magnets. You bring one next to each other. It has a positive and negative end. Poof, they just come right together. So these are the same forces, nuclear forces. 
and they hold everything together. Very important, but certainly is a creation event that just can't be explained. Now here's another mystery within the Big Bang. So after the Big Bang started, we showed all the electromagnetic energy coming out, but it starts as a little dot, a little spot, and that's called singularity because it's a single point. But very rapidly, just like a balloon, this blows up to make our entire universe, and our universe is still getting bigger and bigger and bigger all the time. It's been getting bigger for 13.8 billion years. It's really huge now, but that the universe has a border at some point. It's just hard to ever get there. To get the, it's going out so fast, it's hard to get there at the end. But they know it's expanding. And the scientists know because it's expanding that it mathematically has to have a beginning. So the universe is not an infant time. It's not been here forever. So, now within that are all these other little the, the matter, these would be all the stars that are collected inside the space. So you have to understand that the space was created and then the stuff within the space was created. Both of them are absolute miracles. Now we want to look at some of the, elect the other physical forces and this will be gravity. We know what gravity is. We just talked about how hydrogen through nuclear fusion makes helium and as it does so it gives off heat and light. So when these particles go sailing out in space, they glop together. And why? Because gravity pulls them together. So gravity is a force of nature. It, you, we, when you jump off the chair, you know you're going to go down. When the little particles are out in the atmosphere, they're going to be pulled together and they'll make our stars and our galaxies. It's just full of stuff out there. Here's our Milky Way. This is where we live. Well, this could be us right here in this little dot, but I don't know. Hard to tell. And within, we're in that space, we can see that we're just floating around. So this may be, this is our world right here. It, it's somewhere in our Milky Way. But gravity holds us to the ground. Gravity holds us in our galaxy. And gravity is what makes all of the stars in the universe. Now we're going to go on to another creation event that's absolutely astounding. Well... The question is, hydrogen and helium are fine, they're nice, but where did all the solid stuff come from? And the answer is going to be supernova stardust. And how does that happen? Well, it happens because stars can run out of enough hydrogen to make helium, so they lose power and they collapse by gravity into, and create intense, as they do that, intense heat and light. And basically they explode. And when they explode with all that heat and life, it made the 94 elements that we need for life. And because it explodes, it blasts it out in space. You can see all the dust out here. This is stardust. And it's absolutely remarkable to think of you and I are all made of stardust. But the question we're going to go into is how does it get to us? We'll follow it. The true mystery alert here is our supernova, the one that made all the essential elements for us, we don't, it, will, it made them then, but it won't be needed by us for billions of years later. And why did you just make the 94? Mostly it's 92 is really essentials that we use. There's a couple extras on there, and now there's actually more up to 98. And not much more or much less. Only a creator's intelligent design could be behind this decision. So we're going to talk about the supernova's elementary stardust as a very key creative event. So, I heard we were made out of stardust. Is that true? And the answer is yes. Now, of all the elements out there, we, there are 92 of them out of the total that are essential for elements for life. And we know that they were blasted out into the universe. But what good is that? How do they get to us? Well, that's where the nifty nebula comes in. There are these astronomical creations that corral all that stardust. And it swirls around in a plate like this. It's, it's, a, it's a flat, it's not a star. It's just a mechanism. How it works is, not, is unknown. But what it does is it spins around and collects all of the stardust. And it takes, in the middle, it makes a secondary star. And one of those secondary stars is the sun. And from the periphery, it makes planets. And that's what happened in our particular nifty nebula. The sun is the, sec is the star. And around it go the planets. And around it is us. And this nifty nebula... This is absolutely remarkable. Who can believe it? 
This is as big as the Big Bang. This nifty nebula grabbed all of the stuff we need to have life on Earth and put it in all in our planet. And our planet was then fixed at a distance from the sun that's just perfect so we don't burn up by being too close or freeze by being too far, as we see the other planets in our solar system are doing very well. But our planet just happens to be able to be at the right distance to have life. And all this happened about 4.5 billion years ago. On previous slides, I said I would address the concept of essential elements. Elements are the building blocks of nature. They're all the substance, all the different parts that make up our Earth and our life. They started, remember, with a hydrogen, and it fused to make helium. And this caused these, this nuclear fusion of these things, the multiple ones of these and a few extra neutrons. And the next thing you know, this gives off heat and light. And that's what the stars are. They're collapsed. They have filled up with these gases, but they get close enough together that this process goes on, and you make heat and light, and that's why we see the stars. But when they run out of energy, it collapses. We talked about the supernova. When that happened, it takes millions of these and starts jamming them together, and it created 98 elements, but we only used 92 of these for life. That's absolutely astounding that the collapsing star would make the 92 elements we need today to live. And we're not going to, the star made them billions of years ago, and we're only going to need them now. That's, uh, that's just astounding to me. Now, what are some examples of elements? Well, you know that you take a deep breath and you're breathing oxygen, hydrogen, and, uh, and, and nitrogen. That's, that's all filled up in the air. Take a deep breath. <sighs> Feels good. That's oxygen going in. You can look at metal. If you look at your bicycle, it's made out of iron or aluminum. And you look in your watch, it could be gold or silver or your money. You, here's some elements. You take carbon. Mix it with a little water and sodium and potassium, and whoop, you can have life. And you can take the elements, like silicon, mix it with a little oxygen, it makes sand. The sand compresses, and the next thing you know, you have rocks that make up our whole earth. So these are the elements. But why did it just stop at the, include the 92 that we need to have life? That's absolutely a miracle. Now to give credit where credit is due, we thank our particular supernova that made the 92 elements that we need to live and deposited them as stardust so they could make us later. And the Nifty Nebula collected all that stardust and made our sun, made millions of stars, but our particular Nifty Nebula made our sun and made our planet. It put our planet Earth right at the right spot. We call the habitable distance. It wasn't too, too close, it wasn't too far. But what did it look like? Well, this is what this is a recreation of what it looked like. This is it was all on fire. It was all molten rock. It went from 4.6 billion years when it was created down to probably two and a half billion years before the seas really formed and the land masses formed. But you still are still on fire. It took another probably billion years before you get the Earth cool enough and the atmosphere formed to have early life forms. Then at about one billion years ago, this is an important landmark, at one billion years you get the type of cells that we use today. These are called eukaryocytes, your cells. That's easy. Your cells happened about one billion years ago with earliest life forms, just single cell little creatures. But they were able to divide into two arms. One arm became plants and one arm became animals. Now the plant part moved up on land and started making enough oxygen so the animal part could work. And it did so over time. We'll talk about that in just a minute. And ultimately, you get to the point where there's a nice atmosphere, there's plants, there's animals, and there's us. Now, before we move on, we have to deal with what it is to be a living cell. And the cells make up whatever it is. So we have billions of cells in our bodies. There's heart cells make the heart. Muscle cells make you able to jump and run around. Your brain cells make you think. They're all important. And they all go together. They fuse in what we call biosynthesis. So all the parts work. But they, from the very get-go, for the very first cell, all of these parts had to be in place. Now we're going to use the, your cell phone, because everybody's got a cell phone. We're going to use it as a comparison. So if you take a single cell, Maybe it's your brain cell, maybe it's your kidney cell, maybe it's your heart cell, it doesn't matter. 
or maybe it's just the first bacteria that was ever formed. That's more important because it was such a creative event. Now what has to happen is that all of this has to happen at the same time. You can't take pieces, move them around, and just hope they come together. So it's an absolute mystery that any life forms happened at all. So what does a cell need? It has to have a nucleus full of DNA. The DNA is the instruction manual. It's going to tell everybody else what to do, what proteins, how you make energy, how you get rid of debris, how you replicate. All these things happen in this DNA area. Then you're going to have things that have energy. These are the mighty mitochondria. This tells these little guys that they should be busy, but they got their own DNA. So you not only have the nuclear DNA, you have the mitochondrial DNA. And in plants, you also get the chloroplasts. You see they're green because everything in a leaf is green. Everything in a, that green comes from the chlorophyll, and that's a special little molecule inside their cells that gives you the green color and does a very, very important role. We'll talk about that in just a minute. Because without the plants making the oxygen, well, there's no life for anybody. Then the whole package has to have a case around it, which we call the cell wall. And then you have to have all the fluid on the inside because these proteins float around in here and then go in and out and do various things. All of that, see, they go in. You don't want the bad stuff on the outside to come in, so it has to be a smart wall. It can't just be stupid and let bad things come in. It doesn't. It blocks them out. It takes good things and sends them out. So all of this is for a single cell. When we say the first eukaryocyte 2 billion years or 1 billion years ago, everything had to be created at the same time. That's an absolute impossibility on a random event. This, and it happens at a specific time in our history. So how does that compare? Now, if you look at your cell phone, it has the outside case. That's the cell wall. It has the computer memory. Here's the little computer in there. That's the same as all this DNA. That DNA from the nucleus in the mitochondria and the chloroplast all are, are on this little computer system that runs your phone. Same thing. Then it has to have a way to charge the battery and uh, it has to have power. So that's the little mitochondria. They are able to take stuff that's delivered in here. This is the the glucose you take in or whatever ma uh, material you take in, this picks it up and turns it into a fuel. And that's uh, the fuel is called ATP and it, it, it runs everything in our body. If your mitochondria aren't working, you're not alive. And it's the same thing here. If your battery goes dead, your phone does not work. And then there's lots of functions down here that you have all these extra functions. And functions could be something like the chloroplast. The chloroplast functions, the cell could be running just fine, but without a chloroplast, it can't make oxygen and it can't make glucose, both of which we need. So the plants have a special deal. They have both the nucleus, the mitochondria, and the chloroplast, and we'll talk about that in a minute. But you can see it makes sense. If you understand the parts of your phone, you understand everything about cell biology. Pretty neat. So we're going to look at three particular things. Uh, three per these are all major creative events. What is the dynamic DNA, which is the instruction manual to run cells, the jolly green chloroplast to make oxygen, and the mite of mitochondria. This is our energy source. And finally, we get to the spark of life. Now, the fourth creation event is DNA, and it comes in the nucleus and a little special organelle called inside a cell that generates all the energy, but it has its own DNA, mitochondrial DNA, and then the chloroplast is in Mitochondria and nuclei are in plants and animals, but the chloroplast, remember this is green stuff. See, it's green. So anything with green, any green leaf has this chloroplast in it, and that's what its DNA looks like. But the DNA is just an instruction manual, but it's written not in words or numbers, but in proteins. So all these little protein links in here have information, and the cell has to translate it here to make any, anything it wants, any kind of protein or any anything. It has to read these things out and then make it, which is an absolute mystery how that could happen in a single cell at the beginning in this primordial soup, this toxic soup that's living in, in the sea. And that just cannot happen in any reasonable way by any random motion, random activity of anything. This has to have the Creator's help. This is all part of the Creator's design, part of the plan.
Now the last of the creative events is the spark of life. You can put a whole lot of chemicals together in proteins and it doesn't turn in automatically to a living thing. There's chemical reactions and so you might get a little of this and you might get a little of that, but you don't automatically, just randomly, develop a cell wall and all kinds of cell structures. But even if you do that, it doesn't turn into a, there's a, another element and that's the spark of life and we don't know anything about that except it's a creative event. Nobody can explain how you mix all these structures together and they start to live. That's uh, truly a miracle. Now if you want to have a challenge, you can go to the sea and pick up some sand and water, put it in a pail, put it on your porch. And how long, how long do you think that'll sit there before a frog hops out of that? Just by random chance. In my estimation, that's impossible. Therefore, it had to be created. So it is the most reasonable that all living things were formed by a creative hand. When they were given life and when they were given the ability to live on land or in water and to adapt their environment. So adaptive change is an important part of life. If you don't adapt, you don't make it because the nature is always changing. Now briefly, we're going to look at the geological timelines and the life forms that happened. Let's take a look and see what the Earth has looked like from the beginning. Remember, the universe was created at 13.8 billion. It, the Earth, our Earth, was created about 4.6 or 4.5 billion years ago. And it starts out as a molten Earth. And it's just it's basically all, it's just still molten, means it's on fire. It's a sphere, but it's still on fire. You can see the fire in there. This is a graphic representation. But no life can exist on at this time. So it starts to cool. By 4.5 billion years, you start to get water but you can see the land is still molten so there's no life at this time it continues to cool and begin to form an atmosphere the land and seas are formed and the very earliest life forms start about this time there you have two little forms called archaea and bacteria you've heard of bacteria and archaea and bacteria still exist today the archaea still live in hydrothermal vents now the land of course doesn't look very good the land is all accumulated together it's called it's got a name called pangaea but all, all the continents were just in one big block, and the rest of it was sea. So over time, that's gonna, they're going to separate, and we'll follow that along as we go. But it starts like this, and it's, there's no life on Earth at all. It's just still rock and not very hospitable. There's no topsoil. There's no nothing. But the earliest life forms start in the sea, and it goes along for a, another down to one billion years. So it drops a, a billion and a half years, and you start getting the earliest cells that are called eukaryocytes, which are the kind of cells that we have in all of our bodies, in all of our plants, and all of our animals. So they were a, a big upgrade from the bacteria. Now these are still single cells, but they have all these little parts like mitochondria and chloroplasts and nuclear DNA and cell memories and all these things that are real important. And they start running on oxygen. So it's important that when they, these de eukaryocytes develop, they make plants and the plants have that chloroplast, which makes it green. So any plant you see is making oxygen. They don't use the oxygen. That's it. They give it off. They use carbon dioxide, which we're trying to get rid of. So it's very important. And these plants start growing onto the land. And they grow further and further and further. And as they do that, these single cells can start developing into plants and more and more multicellular creatures. And the plants go online. And pretty soon... You next have you have animals, but it took the plants on the earth to make the oxygen for animals to exist. But all of these came into being from virtually nothing. There was nothing, and then there starts the little life uh, forms, the archaea and the bacteria. Then there's they stay there for a little while. Then all of a sudden, all of these things happen for the eukaryocytes. It's just a miracle. And finally, we get to this point. Well, what happens next? Well, we go down to the year from the 1 billion down to 541 million. So that's a big drop in time. And you start all of these eras that are going along. And they they are just demarcations of what happened. So here's where the, in this time, the plants moved on land. They started to make oxygen. Then in the waters, marine plants started to grow. Then, at this point in time, the fishes showed up. And in this part of time, millions of years, then the four-legged animals come out. and in each case, these d just developed without a preceding event. Then a little bit later, you have the insects and trees. But you see what happens is that 
all of the plants are related to the eukaryocytes that got the chloroplast plus the nucleus and the mitochondria. They got all of it. Whereas the animals only needed the mitochondria and the DNA from the nucleus. But all those plants provided all the oxygen and actually the glucose for the animals to survive. So it keeps on going. Now you have the seed bearing plants. After that, you get down to about 250 million years ago, and then you hit the tr Jurassic and Triassic period where you had this is the age of the dinosaurs. But unfortunately for them, an asteroid hit the Earth and caused, uh, caused them all to go, out, go extinct. They all died, and it left littler animals. They all disappeared. But what happens after that is the age of the small mammals. So the little mice and all the other little creatures, they made it through this extinction. The dinosaurs disappeared. Well, after that, you go through a number of other episodes and then you've eras, and you end up with what we call the Cenozoic Era. And it has parts too. So we had the first part had hominids like monkeys. And then the next part had hominids like apes and chimps. And then the next part had hominids like early man. But these are not Homo sapiens like we have. It took down to 200,000 years. So we've gone from 4.5 billion years down to 200,000 before the first Adam and Eve show up. And then that's at 200,000. But it wasn't until 75,000 that things changed. They changed very dramatically. These Homo sapiens live pretty much in the jungles in uh, northern Africa. And they left no remnants. They, they did not bury their dead. They did not make anything. They didn't have any cave art. There was no evidence of language, anything else. But all of a sudden, in 75,000 years, wow, things change. We call this the ensouling event because at this time, now people could talk. They could decide where to move. And they started moving around the continents. They had art. And they also buried their dead as if there's knowing, even at that time, that there was a heaven and that takes us all the way down to the present. So this ensouling event is important. We humans have been given a soul, allowing self-awareness. This soul gives us our sense of being, a sense of purpose. It makes us who we are and whether we feel good about ourselves. That's called a sense of well-being. So if we kind of, we've talked about seven important days, seven creation events. And in each of these events, what happened had no precedent. There was nothing that it, it just happened out of the blue. There's no good reason why it just didn't go from one thing to the next thing because it could. Like you build a house and you start with a few planks and you build it up and up and whatever. Or your mom is your mom and your her mom is your grandmother and so on and so forth. It goes all the way back through generations. But in these cases, those little early bacteria and archaea and the eukaryocyte cell, single cells, they came out of the blue. Our universe started out of nothing. The stars made the 92 essential elements. The nifty nova put everything together and made our planet just for the right of life. Then the dynamic DNA, which is a terribly complex structure, provided an instructional manual, instruction manual to do everything a cell does. The jolly green chloroplast made green plants. If you see leaves, look at the sky, you know that those green plants gave that oxygen. And the mighty mitochondria, that's the energy. That's the, that's the engine for the whole thing. So without any of these three parts, we would not be here. And finally, you have the spark of life. Plus, we just talked about the addition of the soul, but that's only for the current human beings. Now, here's how we end this thing. How important is this gift of life? Well, it's extremely important. For instance, here's a, here's a question for you. Do you think a tornado could pass through a junkyard and just by random luck produce an airplane with the pilot ready to take off? You think this tornado going through this pile of garbage can end up with this all shined up, ready to go, and there's the pilot, a living person in a mechanical de device? I would say that's impossible. But that's exactly what our creation story is. You had all this stuff in the water as it got just from the uh, creation of the earth. But it's just floating around. And then we, we look at what happened in creation. We look at all these amazing events in the story of our universe, how it came to be, all our planet, all the plants and animals on the planet. And you realize that everything is fine-tuned, which means it's really put together really good, just for life. 
This, just like making this airplane, cannot be a random event. Something is behind it. And that's what we say. There is clearly a design for every creative event. And for every event, it turned out, came out of nothing. So only a creator could pull this off. Only a creator could make the creation events and then turn it all on with the spark of life. So, so you now can look around your own world every day and recognize the fingerprints of our creator everywhere. You can feel your heart beating. That is the mitochondria working in all the cells that are just for heart cells. You can think about stuff and that's your brain cells. And they all had to be energized by the mitochondria. You take a deep breath and you think of the trees. You look outside and you see the green grass and the green trees. They're making that oxygen that you're breathing. And you realize if it weren't for the Creator, all of these parts could never be turned on and make us each and every day happy.